So good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining this evening. My name is Kasian Soldakevich. I'm the president of the Ukrainian Canadian Professional and Business Association here in Ottawa. And I want to welcome you uh, to this 35th annual uh, Ivan Sumko Memorial Lecture. A few technical housekeeping things that you should know about for this evening. Uh, you'll have uh, a Q&A button likely at the bottom of your screen or it might be in the top right hand corner. And that's where you'll be able to pose questions uh, throughout tonight's presentation. Feel free to send in those questions anytime and uh, we'll get to the Q&A later on after the presentation. Uh, for tonight's presentation, UCPBA is, is proud to uh, be co-sponsoring this uh, tonight's presentation. Uh, we've been a uh, strong partner with the Chair of Ukrainian Studies for many years, and we're so happy to have another lecture happen once again this year, even though we have a pandemic going on that hopefully will be starting to subside in the next couple of months. Uh, so with that, I'd like to hand it off to the Chair of Ukrainian Studies, Dr. Dominique Farrell, uh, to lead tonight's presentation off. Dr. Farrell. Thank you, Kassian. Um, well, welcome to what is actually the first uh, event of the Chair of Ukrainian Studies this year because of the pandemic. We were obviously grounded. There's nothing happening on campus. And uh, Zoom events, well, there's, there's a whole lot going on. Uh, but, um, I mean internationally um, but the Franco lecture is uh, has been going on for a long time uh, actually longer than the existence of the chair of Ukrainian studies it started in the 1980s even uh, uh, before there was a chair an initiative of um, faculties at the University of Ottawa but they were actually uh, hosting the the lecture at Carleton University. So it is a, a big event. The, the very last event actually on campus in 2020 was the 2020 Franco lecture, which took place literally uh, eight days before the campus closed in, in March of 2020. Um, so it is befitting that the, the following events is still uh, the Franco lecture. Um, as Cassian just uh, alluded to as things are getting better, as we know, with vaccination, but unfortunately, we're unable to, um, to announce that there will be activities in the fall in, in person. It appears to be still unlikely. There'll be some teaching. Uh, extent of the teaching in person remains to be seen, uh, but I am an optimist. And I can't see why there wouldn't be events in winter of 2022. Um, so the next Franco lecture will be in person, at the very least. I can make this prediction. Um, so we're happy to have the lecture and for the first time um, to also have attendees not from the greater Ottawa region, thanks to Zoom. So we have attendees from Canada and the United States. I didn't send the announcement in Europe because of the time lag. I don't think people, people like Olga, Olga a lot, but you know, two in the morning, <laughs> that might be a little, a little tough. So we're very, very pleased to host um, Olga Onu um, for the Franco Lecture. Olga is an associate professor, senior lecturer in politics at the University of Manchester, currently in exile in Canada during COVID, but I assume you'll be going back in the fall. Is, she's also an associate of the Harvard Ukrainian Institute. Um, Olga is a leading expert on civic, pro civic protest in Ukraine, Eastern Europe, and Latin America, where she actually lived um, earlier on. Her first book, Mapping Mass Mobilization, is the first contentious politics account of mass protest in Ukraine and the first comparative analysis of both elite activists and citizen level mobilization processes. She's very active on, in the media, uh, international media, also as a policy, advising policy makers in Ukraine, UK, Canada, US, EU. Uh, but she, as, as we said in the, in the pre, um, um, well, lecture conversation we had among ourselves, uh, Olga is a very charismatic person and she's attracting uh, a great many uh, doctoral students. Um, she has currently seven, five of them in Ukrainian studies, which gives her 
pretty much the gold medal in terms of the number and the quality of uh, doctoral students. Uh, all of that to say uh, that beyond her scholarship, uh, Olga is a uh, dynamic presence in the field, in the growing field of Ukrainian studies. Um, she's also very prolific. We mentioned her earlier book. Um, uh, among her recent publications, uh, she uh, edited uh, a very important symposium in, in, in the top journal in, in our field, post-Soviet affairs, on identity politics in Ukraine in the times of crisis, uh, with seminal articles, including her own article. So that was a few years ago, and she also wrote a very interesting piece on the, the Odessa tragedy uh, of 2014, the massacre, well, the, the, the tragedy. Uh, believing facts in the fog of war, identity, media, and hot cognition in Ukraine's 2014 Odessa tragedy. Um, but she'll be talking not about what happened seven years ago, but what's happening right now in the time of the pandemic. So Olga, thanks for coming on electronically from Toronto, and uh, we look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dominique, and to uh, the for the invitation to everyone for the I'm really touched by your words. You cut you you managed to make me uh, I can't find the words to speak. Uh, and that's not difficult, I would say, but thank you so much. Uh, coming from you, that is incredibly uh, touching. And thank you so much for saying those kind words. And I hope I can live up to at least a little bit of what Dominique has said. So I slightly am adjusting what I'm going to be telling you today. And I decided to do this little, a lot has happened since the date I was supposed to give this lecture. My grandfather passed away and one of the last conversations that we were having was about the 30 years since independence. And that was such an important milestone in his view um, that 30 years have passed in, since Ukrainian independence. So I'm trying to contextualize what is happening today in Ukraine um, along the lines of protest, migration, and political opinion um, in in this longer term view of Ukraine at 30 years. So Ukraine is 30, Ukraine is 30 years old, um, which is an incredible accomplishment, but at the same time, Ukraine is still very young. And in that 30 years, Ukrainians have faced many difficulties uh, along the way, resulting in ma mass protests, several mass protests. Mass migration, out migration out of the country, we see a continuous decline in Ukrainian population over the last three decades. And of course, even the most tragic conflict. And at each turn, some observers repeatedly, not only thought, but voiced that Ukraine as a state, as a nation would not make it. So as we take stock of the current situation, we must not only acknowledge that there is much to be worried about in Ukraine, of course, with pandemic, poverty, oligarchic corruption and the conflict with Russia. We must also note, as our research shows, that the citizens today actually see these elements in a trade-off. They do not think we can solve all these problems at once. And perhaps looking back at some of how far Ukraine has come will allow us to understand better what troubles it today. So I want to put into perspective both 30 years ago and at different increments over the last 30 years, Ukraine was faced with these numerous worst case scenario expectations, right? And I want to highlight three, although there could be a few others. The first is that Ukraine has a weak civil society. It has no history of major people power. And uh, this was, of course, expected to be a major impediment to, dem to democratization. The reality, of course, is that Ukraine is now known as a protest nation even. Um, then you have this expectation that the post-Soviet oligarchy 
will not only be obviously corrupt and problematic, but it will lead to a type of authoritarianism like we see in other neighboring countries, be it in Russia or in Belarus. And of course, the reality of the situation in Ukraine is that oligarchic competition uh, has been a feature, but not a detriment to Ukrainian state stability. And we see the continuous rise of newcomers over at least the last seven years. And third, this worst scenario, scenario expectation of post-Soviet deindustrialization and privatization, that it would not only lead to this economic collapse, but that it would also radicalize and divide politics in Ukraine uh, along nationalist populist identity lines, but also that it would allow aggressive neighbors to co-opt and control the country. And for many years, the actual reality of this, although there was massive deindustrialization, privatization and economic crisis one after the other, migration has been repeatedly this release valve where the tensions in society could be released. So we have the protest nation is one form of release or engagement empowerment. We have migration as another release of tension within the society. And in fact, oligarchic competition arose with the rise of newcomers. So somehow, and to mine and my Dido's uh, true happiness, Ukraine is the country that keeps uh, taking us by surprise. Now I can talk about many anecdotes of big names who it took by surprise and I could you know, out some famous folks here. Uh, a particular a Polish diplomat comes to mind in, in, in the 2014 protest crisis. Most recently, uh, an American economist probably mistweeted uh, and caused a little bit of a storm with his false uh, predictions. But I think a lot of these expectations around Ukraine, be it 30 years ago, over the last 30 years, or today, uh, arise from the fact that many people don't actually follow the data. And that we allow some of our preconceived biases about the country drive our understandings and opinions of what is happening today. So everything that I'm going to tell you today is based on around 15 years of comparative data collection in Ukraine, which includes hundreds of qualitative interviews, dozens of focus groups, uh, thousands of documents and archives analyzed. I conducted two separate protest surveys in the country myself, and then along with colleagues uh, Henry Hale, Tim Colton, Nadia Kravitz, I conducted uh, a survey in 2014, um, a three-wave survey, and then since then with both Henry Hale, Volodya Kulik, and Gwen Sasa um, in two separate projects, we've collected data on public attitudes, dispositions, and especially on protest and migration uh, engagement practices. So in total about 11 surveys in the last 15 years. And I will address each of these three expectations um, in turn, but I will elucidate how political behavior in public in Ukraine have not in fact aligned with them, which I already hinted at. Uh, but I will also make sure to place things into the context to show how the pandemic is further shaping these factors. And although Ukraine has successfully turned 30 soon enough, it's happening, it's coming soon, there is this pandemic warning and it applies obviously not only to Ukraine but elsewhere. But I think in Ukraine, because it is compounding existing crises, we should be very weary. So the first expectation, a weak civil society and no people power. <laughs> well, gosh, you can't even say that without laughing out loud, can you? Has anyone ever gotten anything more wrong than this? You know, Ukraine once thought to be this country of a weak civil society where, of course, activism and, and a meaningful political engagement would struggle to flourish. Uh, is now known as this poster child for contentious politics in the region. I mean, Belarus is sure giving Ukraine a run for its money this last year, but really Ukraine is the place where protest happens. And a lot of people have turned to study Ukraine precisely because they are interested in mass mobilization. Uh, 
ordinary citizens in Ukraine are here the real heroes and heroines of the story. They've shown this impressive capacity to repeatedly stage countrywide mass mobilizations and repeatedly get rid of oligarchs and authoritarians in turn. So not only is Ukraine an outlier really in the region for being this hyper protest place, uh, it perhaps always was in the Soviet period too. Uh, unfortunately, the study of the legacy of contention has been completely overlooked in the country. And for this reason, I believe various false expectations were formed. For instance, the Maidan generation. Please, if you do me one favor, if you would like to do me a favor, perhaps you wouldn't, but if you would, please stop calling it the Maidan. I think calling the Yevromaidan, or if you must, the revolution of dignity that occurred in 2013-14, I typically like to call it a mass mobilization. Uh, if you call it the Maidan, you are doing a disservice to this history of 30 years of mass mobilization and those heroes and heroines of Ukrainian contention. But more importantly, right, so it's not the Maidan generation and the expectations around it. It's the Maidan generation and expectations around it from 2014. It, sorry, 2004, the Orange Revolution. It's the Maidan generation, the original old school Maidan generation from 1990 and then later protest events in 1991, right? This generation is often overlooked in our analysis of protest events uh, and contention. And yet this generation rose up at least three times in some cases in the last 30 years. So when we study contentious politics in Ukraine, because like with all mass mobilizations, because we never expect them to occur, we tend to focus on external factors as driving them. So we tend to focus on foreign financing or technological diffusion as a main channeling factor of creating mobilization. And of course, more recently, we have turned to focusing on social media. It's something that we don't really understand the process of mobilization. So we say the social media factor. And typically these things might, these factors, these variables might be important, but they're not the sole variables that are important to the mobilization process. Because we also are often taken by surprise in these instances, and we don't have a team ready to conduct research, uh, you know, to deploy into the field. I got very lucky in 2014, I was able to do so, but we don't always have that capacity. We also tend to focus on what we can see and what we have access to. Um, and here, youth, this new generation myth uh, that then forms, is often uh, a, a feature of our quick access analyses. And of course, youth are much more likely to use new technologies and they are much more likely to be present in those Facebook posts, tweets, Instagram uh, posts, and even Telegram. Another thing that we tend to see more prominently because it gets media coverage is any violence. So we tend to overblow acts of violence in their importance in our analysis of contention. And this has certainly been the case in Ukraine. Even when there was a wall of fire during the Yevromaidan, uh, which was closer to where the Dynamo Kiev Stadium was for those of you who, who know uh, Kiev well, even when there was a wall of fire, just a few hundred meters down in the Maidan, there were people peacefully protesting in a variety of other ways. Uh, of course, the particular nights of the most, the, the, the greatest violence are slightly different, but the general um, episode of protest that we observed over those months was in fact predominantly peaceful. But how many times can you show people packing sandwiches? Or even another very visible element is right-wing nationalism. Now, please don't misunderstand me. Uh, I in no way would like to say that right-wing nationalists were not in some way present in the Yevromaidan um, or in the Orange Revolution. 
or for that matter, in that revolution on the granite, the old school, the original Maidan. But they are nowhere near the majority of protesters. In fact, by our own estimations, uh, according to our protest survey conducted on the Maidan in, in Kiev in 2014, people that would be affiliated with right-wing nationalist parties or organizations represented 5% or less of the active protest population. And because we uh, conducted our surveys on every day of the week and not just simply on certain week evenings, we actually get a very good understanding of who was out there. Um, and so that certainly wasn't the case, but of course, right-wing nationalist or a person throwing a Molotov cocktail is a more sensational image that gets shared and now reposted and goes viral. Sometimes we do this because we look for easy answers, but most of the time it's because we don't know the past well enough. And this is why I decided to honor my Dido uh, here a little bit. The history of contention in Ukraine is really auspicious. And any scholars that are now turning to Ukraine to study mass mobilization or activism should really do a deep dive into the history of contention. Now, these two slides that I'm showing you here show a very surface level overview of key moments and movements of action since about the 1960s. In my own book, I actually date uh, the start of contemporary contention in Ukraine to the very early 20th century, where I was able to physically trace actors, ideas, pamphlets that connect over time from about 1910 to 1920 to the very, to today. These events, these social movement organizations, these protest episodes are interconnected. We might only be aware of those blue ones, those ones that are larger, those ones that make it to our TV screen, but contention in Ukraine is ongoing. So even when those expectations were written, be it 30 years ago or a little bit later, they were already missing the mark when it came to Ukraine. And I wanna share with you this quote from um, an activist that was part of the revolution on the granite. They said, we are obsessed with discussing the past, the, sorry, the present as if the past didn't happen. We are blinded by youth and then quickly forget them when they become the youth of yesterday. And I think this is my key issue with the notion of the Yevromaidan generation as something to be looking forward and looking to in terms of politics today in Ukraine. Our, a lot of our research and analysis of the Yevromaidan was indeed quite short-sighted with a focus on the youth and this expectation of the so-called Yevromaidan generation. The problem is we know for a fact that the median protester was 36. About 15% of the protesters uh, on the Maidan at any given point in time were the grandparents or as they would like to be called, this is one such protester who actually coined the term for our team, the guardians of protest in Ukraine. In fact, youth only made up about 25% of the protest population. If we consider that it was estimates across the country, about 2 million people were actively regularly engaged in protest events. What happens to the rest 75 in our story? Moreover, um, research of mine with uh, Cressy Arkwright, uh, who is a PhD student of mine, uh, found that there is no evidence of any coalescing today around a Yevromaidan generation. So the youth, the people that were 18 to 25 specifically, and that's in, in a lot of socialization, political science, social science theories, 18 to 25 would be considered those, um, the, those years when one can be particularly influenced by political dynamics. And the first engagement in elections or protests during that period would have a very important uh, uh, impact on one's future engagement and protest. And we find actually doing a, a cohort analysis that there is no evidence that the youth, the 18 to 25 year olds of 2014 were in any way coalesced into a clear generation. 
they are very divided on a variety of things, just like all Ukrainians. But more importantly, I think they are not necessarily more pro-democracy. Uh, in fact, many of them are disenchanted with democracy, not only in Ukraine, but as a notion across the region. Uh, I think even more interesting is that this generation uh, of, of, of Yevromaidan uh, youth are not actually any more pro-Ukraine pro uh, pro -Ukraine joining the EU. So that is a really fascinating phenomenon that this group of young people who were socialized and politicized during the, the hottest period in Ukrainian um, contemporary history, uh, which was all around uh, European values, joining the EU, European notions of democracy, are not in fact aligning with any of those policies or preferences. Thus, it should not surprise any of you when we learn that the Ukrainian population is also split on the Evromaidan. Now here, this graph is showing you data from 2014, but we repeated this question in later uh, surveys and we find it pretty much exactly the same findings. Although about 60% um, of Ukrainians believe that the Evromaidan was an, uh, an uprising by ordinary people, 18% believe it was a coup or a CIA plot. Now, these are obviously conspiracy theories um, bounded to a lot of disinformation that has been circling in Ukraine. Uh, but who believes these conspiracy theories? You might have some hypotheses, probably based on some of your own uh, biases, I would say, because one thing that is clear is that this in no way aligns with uh, more typical ethno-linguistic or linguistic practice uh, lines in, in any way, shape, or form. In fact, in a paper that we just published, I believe last month, it was, it was made available um, with uh, Emma Troop, another PhD student of mine, and Julian Waller, uh, we find that the people who believe this in disinformation, who believe these conspiracy theories, one might say, about a coup or CIA plot in Ukraine with the Yevromaidan protests, are only uh, are only different from the general population in two ways. The first is that they are far more likely to watch Russian television, and that's not a surprise. But also that they are far more likely not necessarily to be less educated, but to be less well off financially. Economic inequality and insecurity seem to be a very important element in Ukraine in believing these types of disinformations. So this is an example, obviously, of such disinformation that was happening at the time. This is an English language channel, but obviously the message here is similar to the Russian television uh, stations themselves. What is more, again, interesting in the post Yevromaidan context, the last seven years of Ukrainian attitudes towards protest and contention, and specifically towards the Euromaidan, is that we see a real, real pattern of pro protest polarization. Interestingly, people who support the aims the goals such as deposing Yanukovych or joining the EU do not necessarily support the means to, of protests such as going out into the street, um, taking uh, more direct action, nor do they align with those who support the ends, the outcomes of the protests. Very few people are actually very happy about how the protests turned out, in fact. Many believe that they caused more harm than good. So where are we today, the last seven years to pandemic? Well, interestingly enough, in the last seven years since the Evromaidan, the perception that protests influence the situation in the, in, the, in the country, in Ukraine, has dropped by 30%. So very few people believe in protest efficacy in Ukraine, even though Ukraine is now believed to be this protest nation. As I already said, 
the number of people that believe that the Yevra Maidan caused more harm than good has also risen in the last seven years by about 9%. So this protest nation phenomenon in Ukraine is of course a double-edged sword. It becoming the place where protest happens might be problematic for democracy itself. Protest need not be democratic or civil. And we've seen that in, in, in even in Ukraine as well. It, we also clearly see some post Maidan disenchantment over the last few years. Might we see more of it? Might we see protest fatigue? Um, Tucker and Mirkovitz actually had a piece a few years back where they would have suggested, indeed, we would see not only disenchantment, but protest fatigue. So what's happening with the pandemic? Well, if you, if you are as shocked as I am, or perhaps you're not, then you're a better analyst than I, because I did not expect protest readiness to rise and to rise this much since the pandemic started. When we interviewed or surveyed people in 2019, 39% said that they were ready to protest if the situation in their country required it. At the start of the pandemic, right as the lockdown happened, when everyone was very afraid of what was going on, 33% said they were ready to protest. We already thought that was extremely high for a pandemic context. We thought the last thing these people would be thinking of is now taking to the streets. And you have to remember this was a year ago and the way we thought about COVID in the pandemic was very different. Today, um, be it in January when we surveyed the, the whole Ukrainian population or our most recent survey in April, we have a survey in the field now as well, we find that 55% of the population, a majority of the population in Ukraine are ready to protest should it be required. What does this say about the quality of democracy in the country? What does this say about the compounding toll of the pandemic on Ukrainian attitudes? What is also striking is the belief that in the current situation, street protests are the only means to force the government to change its course is at a seven year high. We are now again at 52% of the Ukrainian population agreeing that the only way to change the course in the country is to protest. We haven't seen numbers this high since right after the Yevromaidan in May 2014. To me, uh, an increase of 20% from the beginning of the pandemic to today is a clear warning sign of something amiss. So what are the reasons for this protest? Yes, they are political and yes, corruption is one of them. And this brings us to our second expectation, post-Soviet oligarchy and authoritarianism and its effect on Ukraine. The problem with the way we talk about oligarchy in Ukraine is that we there seems to be a misunderstanding of the who, the how, and what, uh, and to what end. Um, I recommend for those of you who are interested an absolutely wonderful book by Serhii Zhuk, Rock and Roll in the Rocket City, where he tells us about the network structure, specifically of the Dnipropetrovsk clan, but also refers to what was happening elsewhere um, and how these oligarchs. Uh, arose from these various, uh, in, some, in some cases, student networks. But we have a very flawed view, I think, of oligarchs in, in, in Ukraine. Now, please, again, don't get me wrong. I, I'm in no way here saying that oligarchs in themselves should be uh, seen in normative terms as anything good. But they cannot be seen as a zero sum, black and white, pro-EU, pro-Russia, sort of way. If we do that, we miss the point, we misunderstand why Ukraine is the way it is and why Ukraine has actually managed to succeed as a state for so many years. First and foremost, a variety of these oligarchs, we might ourselves quite quickly assign them to one side or the other. That would be quite faulty. They all want access to EU markets. And for those of you who think that Viktor Pinchuk or Akhmetov, Rinat Akhmetov would like to cozy up to Putin, maybe even see Ukraine as part of Russia, you're, I believe, truly mistaken because they want to be big fish in their own Black Sea and not small fish in Putin's private pond. <laughs> 
They want to be gold global players and they want to legitimate their wealth and philanthropy. Most importantly, they are part of these networks or clans that form this multipolarity of economic and political power in Ukraine. And here, I think a good example to look at is Tzabelis's work. And this multipolarity means that the elites, these oligarchs, always need to compromise with each other. And the most successful politicians are those who are able to manage, organize, and coordinate the uh, oligarchs. Kuchma has many, many things and faults to throw at him, but he was an expert political manager. In the post Yevromaidan context, of course, Poroshenko made some fatal flaws in this regard first bringing certain oligarchs on side, then going into full out conflict with them. But besides this, our research shows that electoral clientelism in Ukraine is actually on the decline. Um, some of the research that Henry Hale and I are, were conducting on electoral um, switching uh, as a result of the war in 2014, we found that there was no evidence to suggest that this kind of patronal clientelist networks were a key factor in that electoral switching. Uh, corruption is a key unifying focal point for political engagement and behavior, be it elections, protests, and or migration. Pretty much all of my uh, papers currently that are on that uh, show that corruption is a key factor. But public opinion polls suggest that people are more concerned about everyday corruption and not only about big fish. And this is where we get the Zelensky factor, the Zelensky effect. Uh, some of you might smile at the sight of this, some of you might frown, but in fact, whether it is the truth or not, whether people voted for the candidate or for the character, he did represent to many as someone that was standing up against certain types of everyday corruption in society. And specifically someone that was talking about everyday ordinary Ukrainians plights. He was perceived at least by the Ukrainian electorate as the anti-oligarch candidate. So what has happened since? Well, today, uh, there is a clear new Zelensky divide in the country. And you can call it people versus the VIP, uh, as we say in Ukrainian, or the VIPs. Zelensky is vilified by many of these elite actors, um, but he has accomplished a great deal in the first two years. Much of the policies and accomplishments here are those of his predecessors and the opposition. So I sometimes am puzzled why the opposition does not in fact want to acknowledge these a little bit more. Prisoner releases, the immunity of deputies in the Turkanist in, in the Rada and the parliament, land reform, continuing restrictions on Russian media, which obviously uh, noting my own research is a very good uh, idea. And most recently we know that there is some suggestion that he's going after um, Medvedchuk. And this is all in the context of several crises, you know, a crashing economy, uh, COVID pandemic and continued Russian aggression eating the escalation that we saw a few weeks back. So it's not that bad. Uh, the thing is, the elites are far more divided than ordinary citizens. Yes, Zelensky's approval is down from his high right after he was elected. Um, but when compared to the last three presidents at the same period of time into their presidency, Zelensky is actually doing better than they were. And also Zelensky's legitimacy is not in question whatsoever in Ukraine. Um, here, we find that actually more people tend to agree that President Zelensky is the legitimate elected president than about at the same time into Poroshenko's uh, presidency. And this was just about um, a year and a bit into their presidency. And is there a pandemic penalty on Zelensky? 
So yes, people do not think that Zelensky has handled the COVID crisis well so far, increasingly. Um, the P, the number of people, this, this uh, horizontal line bar, the number of people who believe that he has handled it very badly or in balance not well, has grown from 28% to around 61%. Um, so indeed, there is some suggestion of a potential penalty, yet I wouldn't be so sure. His approval rating does not necessarily correlate to this uh, perception of how he handled the COVID pandemic. In fact, there are many people who fully approve of him uh, or highly approve of him and his presidency that believe he has handled the COVID crisis on balance very badly. So the pandemic penalty isn't as strong for Zelensky. Gwendolyn Sasa and I are working currently on a paper where we find actually that the COVID penalty is much, much larger and stronger at the local level in Ukraine. So certain mayors, uh, certain uh, local politicians should be more weary of a possible pandemic penalty. Zelensky actually seems to be able to at least somehow um, allow some of this to bounce off of him. So it is unlikely that in today's Ukraine, an anti-Zelensky sentiment alone will be the focal point for any protest. Remember, 55% are ready to protest should the need arise. This brings me to a third expectation, the post-Soviet political economy, deindustrialization, privatization that will create poverty and then a series of other events will ensue. And as I already noted, migration has acted as a release valve for the last 30 years. Part of the problem with studying Ukraine is that we don't really know what the population of Ukraine looks like. We haven't had a census since 2001, which makes it very difficult to predict not only how many people are physically in the country, but also to understand a variety of our social science tools. But when it comes to this post-Soviet political economy, the rise of poverty, I think this is the moment, especially with the compounding uh, nature of the current crisis, where we must tread carefully. Because Ukraine is already a lower economic country. Ukrainians are indeed poor. And we need to start paying more attention to the political economy of migration and patience in protest. Whilst there has been some post-2014 averaged decline in poverty rates, uh, most of this decline, I am afraid to say, has been a result of changing the parameters of what it means to be below the poverty rate in Ukraine. But nonetheless, there is some indication that the averaged poverty, line ha poverty rate has decreased. For many in Ukraine, the quality of life, uh, their quality of life has greatly declined since the post-2014 context. And specifically for those in the East and South, the situation became very desperate. And we see repeatedly over every single study, and I have alluded to this already, uh, that we find statistically significant evidence in our data that economic evaluation, economic experiences are the most, increasingly the most important drivers of protest participation, of migration, of partisan support, and policy preferences. But there's an inverse relationship here. If you're better off, you're much more likely to participate in protest. If you're worse off, you're much more likely to migrate, except with the most recent pandemic data. Um, Volodya Kulik and I were discussing this exact element in our own uh, data that we collected over the past year. We were surprised to see that those who are ready to protest are increasingly also those who are reporting a worse economic situation or a worse family financial situation. So the middle class is being joined by other um, lower socioeconomic strata in Ukraine. This is actually telling you a much more dangerous story about who will protest when and how. Uh, sadly, this was almost completely missed by Poroshenko's campaign in 2019 and provides a yet another key explanation for Zelensky's rise to the presidency and for his party's uh, uh, winning the parliament, the majority in parliament. Uh, 
the major correlates of voting for either Zelensky or Sluha Narodu have been economic factors, intention to migrate, and having friends and family abroad. And when you read that last sentence, having friends and family abroad, no, we don't mean in Russia. Actually, having friends and family abroad in Poland specifically increases the likelihood that you voted for Zelensky or Sluha Narodu. That might surprise you. Uh, it does not surprise me because clearly the people who have gone abroad, at least we know this about the Ukrainian migrant population, tend to leave because of economic pressures and then tend to support their family from abroad. This highlights what can be best described as this protest politics migration poverty nexus. Um, and this is really being exacerbated by the COVID crisis. So already a tense economic situation with a conflict in the background is now exacerbated by COVID. And people are actually consistently rather afraid of uh, COVID throughout the pandemic. So the rate of fear of being very afraid of someone afraid hasn't fallen that much over the last year. And the sad truth is, and some of these figures should really give you pause, 18.7% say they contracted COVID in Ukraine. 52% in our surveys said they know someone who has been ill with COVID. 30%, 30% of Ukrainians say they know someone who has died after contracting COVID. Despite this, despite 70% uh, agreeing that the, uh, the, 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 sorry, despite all of this, 70% agree that COVID, even though it's worrisome, the most thing, the thing that they are most worried about is the implications, the economic implications of lockdown. So with 30% of the population knowing someone personally who has died of COVID, still 70% of the Ukrainian population would like to prioritize the economy over any health-related aspects. And as I said, this doesn't mean that they are not afraid. The most recent data that we just got, about 50% are afraid of COVID still today, of catching COVID, and 20% are very afraid. Yet again, this is pointing to the fact that the economic crisis is just that much more felt by people than some of the other effects of the current health crisis and political crisis in Ukraine, and that these effects are indeed cumulative. Finally, migration, that release valve, yes, intent to migrate has skyrocketed. When we first survey in, uh, surveyed a protest, uh, sorry, when we served surveyed Ukrainians in 2014 about their intention to migrate. Henry Hale, Tim Colton, Diakravitz and I found that about 4% of the population wanted to migrate. By 2019, uh, when, when Zelensky was first elected, we had about 19% of the population that wanted to migrate. That's a 15 percentage point increase. By April 2020, as the pandemic has started, 23% wanted to leave. Our most recent data from just a few weeks back, we are nearly at 40% of the Ukrainian population, 38% wanting to leave. So the pandemic effect should give us a moment of pause and it's a clear warning. We as scholars and observers of Ukraine must focus on researching the quality of life and the quality of democracy in Ukraine. Being a protest nation is certainly not all it's cracked up to be, especially if engaging in protests results in greater political disenchantment. The migration release valve might be a good thing, but do we really want to lose that substantial portion of the Ukrainian population? I would say certainly not. And also it has its limits. The pandemic has an exponential effect on the readiness to protest and intention to migrate. And the pandemic situation is far worse in Ukraine than it is in Canada. And therefore its effect will continue. And I, I, I worry to, to think, I, I mean, I can't even think where it will go.
Um, one thing we didn't really mention, but I think is important to underscore when I suggested it when it comes to disinformation and protest engagement, ethnic and linguistic identity is not central to very much in terms of protest engagement or migration in Ukraine. It is fluid, it is situational, it is relational. Um, although even here, uh, a research that we are conducting with Vol Volodymyr Kulik, Henry Hale, and Gwen Sasse suggests that the pandemic also pushes people to view this threat to the nation in ethnic and not civic terms. Politicians certainly must stay away from any ethnic nationalist discourses and divisive politics. Um, the majority of Ukrainians do not prioritize this. It is not electorally sound, as Poroshenko so glamorously, I think, demonstrated, and it can certainly destabilize the country. There's no need to, I think, make enemies at home. Corruption, although the big fish are bad and must be dealt with, and again, please don't get me wrong, in the eyes of ordinary citizens, it's not only about the big fish. It's about systemic changes. It's about their everyday experiences. It's specifically about how those everyday experiences of corruption affect their socioeconomic inequalities and that these are produced and reproduced by the state weakness in Ukraine. And this big warning, the pandemic is exacerbating these socioeconomic divisions. It is also proliferating this everyday corruption in a variety of ways in Ukraine. So I, it looks like I'm obviously ending on quite a, a, a sad note. But this being said, uh, Ukraine has done well considering all the expectations were worst case scenarios. Here today with this pandemic warning, we should learn from the lessons of the past where Ukrainians and Ukraine have succeeded that allowed Ukraine to turn 30 this very year, and perhaps consider how socioeconomic inequalities specifically lead to also democratic inequalities in Ukrainian society. Thank you very much. Oops, thank you, Olga, for this uh, great presentation ending on a rather a sobering note with COVID and the near 40% of the population wanting uh, to leave, that's obviously disturbing. So um, I'm inviting now uh, the very large audience actually to, uh, to use the Q&A uh, for questions. I'll ask you though to um, not be anonymous. So please put yourself uh, with the name. Um, before we proceed with the first question and I will ask the first question if you don't mind. <laughs> Uh, I would like to, um, we have a very large audience, almost 100 people, and as I said earlier, for the first time ever, thanks to Zoom, uh, outside of the greater Ottawa region. Um, so we have actually very distinguished guests from um, in Ukrainian studies, Natalia Khanenko friesen is here with us from the new director of the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies. We have Roman Petrician from the McEwen University. We have Marta Ditschak, I'm sure good friend of Olga uh, from Western Ontario, but in Toronto right now. And I would like to also greet uh, uh, the Honorable Andriy Shevchenko, the Ambassador of Ukraine to Canada. Andriy, we miss you very much. Uh, we, we, can't, uh, we look forward to, uh, to have you actually as a speaker once campus reopens to, uh, to events. Olga, I have a big question. I apologize for the big question, but I'm sure that you've thought of it for years and years and years. Um, I mean, it is amazing historically, and you're telling us it goes back a century, uh, but even in the last 20, 30 years, and in the last decades of the Soviet Union, how protest prone Ukraine has been. Ukraine is a protest society. I remember as a, as a student, uh, watching an interview on French TV from France um, of Charles Tilly, I mean, um, you know, a, a master in many fields, including in protest and conflict studies. Um, he had written one of his numerous books on the history of protest in France, France being kind of the template uh, protest society. So my question to you is, why is Ukraine so, has been historically in, in, in certainly since independence, so protest prone. Um, 
Well, obviously, the, the competitive and open nature of the system, the fact that we don't have brutal repression in Ukraine compared to Belarus and Russia is obviously a factor in allowing the protest to, to a large extent, although as we saw on Maidan, and, and there is repression also in when protest gets very intense. Um, but does it have to do with uh, I don't know, social structure, history, and uh, Western Ukraine? I mean, what is it that makes it so, uh, again, protest friendly? So I think, I think you said something very important that in some periods of Ukrainian history and specifically contemporary Ukrainian history, the openness um, of the system, actually, the relative openness, which is might be a surprising way to analyze Ukraine, I think in some ways, but might have contributed. But you can't say that about the Soviet period, right? So um, one fact that I really like to raise in presentations is that Ukraine had more dissidents per capita than any other Soviet Republic, yes, than Russia during the Soviet period. There is indeed something strange about Ukraine. What it is, I I, I, I would not dare say yet. I think this is the, this is, we need a Tar Charles Tillian style deep history protest event analysis of the 20th century of protest and activism in Ukraine, right? And, and not just saying these things happened, but analyzing them through the social networks, seeing if there are maybe some political opportunity structures that were different in the Ukrainian context, if there was a different political economy. Some of your work about uh, what um, led to the macro regions of Ukraine, right? These historical roots that might explain macro regional variation might also be connected to protest engagement over time. As a Ukrainian, I'd like to think it's in our blood, <laughs> but that's not the answer as a scholar that I would give to you. So I think that is the book that needs to be written still. Um, and yes, I, I, I I invite as many PhD students as possible to come to me or Dominique to the chair of Ukrainian studies in Ottawa to pursue exactly this type of, of question. Right, we, uh, we have a number of questions on, on COVID in Ukraine um, to dealing with vaccination and without mass in inoculation in place by the fall. I have heard another COVID-19 wave likely in Ukraine. That's from Bogdan Chernyavsky. What will the fall look like for the Ukrainian population? Konstantin Poitan, what are the prospects for Ukraine to acquire sufficient vaccines to deal with the pandemic? So these are empirical questions as much as the vaccine situation, uh, vaccination situation is um, certainly not to the level of what we're experiencing in North America or in Western Europe. Um, if I could add, um, in your surveys, um, you survey in terms of attitudes. I mean, um, people are worried. Obviously, we saw that you had an entire slide. But there seems to be a mistrust in Ukraine regarding vaccination. Or the, so that, that's kind of the, the worrying part that, well, vaccine don't seems to be, the vaccination is, is lagging because I would assume the number of doses not there yet. And that's the inequality in the world. Um, but even if it were, do people really want to be vaccinated in the current conditions? That is knowing that historically, and certainly uh, that remains the case, they tend to be mistrustful of, of government because government is not delivered. Yeah. I, I absolutely we do in fact uh, in one of the omnibuses ask about vaccination if a vaccine were available would you take it um, without opening up my statistical uh, my status software I won't be able to tell you the exact answer right now but from my recall it's quite high it is the, the majority of Ukrainians are quite hesitant about the vaccine in some shape or form and that is indeed worrying and that does connect to conspiracy, believing in conspiracy theories of various flavors. And it does connect, as a recent study has found, that does connect to media consumption patterns. Um, but I think you hit the nail on the head, uh, Dominique. Uh, 
people's distrust of that system, right? The corruption, it's not about the big fish. They're not worried that Kolomoisky is gonna bring a bad batch of vaccine. They're worried that the distribution of vaccines will not only be not equitable and will be susceptible to a variety of corrupt transactions, um, that a variety of corrupt transactions had to occur prior to the vaccine even coming to your city or town. Uh, but also, I and in speaking to some colleagues that um, I won't say who they were, they were very well educated, um, internationally minded individuals. They said they couldn't be sure if the vaccine was the real thing because they live in a reality when you go to the pharmacy, you can't be certain if the antibiotic will in fact be the antibiotic or if it will be something else that's not quite this but in the same packaging. Um, and that is really worrying. Um, and uh, I think I, our, our data also show that not only is there vaccine hesitancy and it's connected to these um, aspects, but also that uh, that people have had to live with so much hardship in Ukraine, um, especially people in the East and South, economic, really disastrous economic conditions on constant uh, uh, conflict at their doorstep, that this is just another terrible thing that they have to live through. And they'll live through it as far as it need be. They don't rely on the state it's so weak, it's so corrupt, they won't rely on the state to do so. Uh, and that is, it is quite sad and worrying. Yeah, so we're gonna get what the volunteer, volunteer groups with vaccination, a bit like the model in 2014, the state can't defend ourselves, so we'll do it ourselves. Uh, it is worrying. We have questions coming in quite, quite a bit. I'm gonna cluster two on protest movements from Michael McKay. Why have protest movements not evolved into issues-based political parties in Ukraine? What have all political parties, why have all political parties been weak, leader-based ones? Um, and another question by Celeste Beasley, how much is there a demonstration effect of previous protest on views of protest or on, or on views of democracy? Is readiness to protest correlated with views of the effects of the Orange Revolution? EM, what's EM? I'm blanking. Iromaidan. Iromaidan, thank you. <laughs> or other previous protests? Um, <clears throat> so I think it's a very good question why protest movements have not evolved into political parties, uh, but really rarely do we see in the contemporary uh, world pro protest activists, I mean, we're talking since the 2000s, not in the 90s and 80s, because that did in fact happen in places, be it in, in, in Brazil with um, the, the, the Workers' Party, or be it in Poland with Solidarność, that certainly has happened in the past. We don't see that same trend in Ukraine for various reasons, I think. Um, in each of the cases uh, that I have studied at great length, um, and as I said, I interviewed more than 400 um, politicians, activists, and protest organizers over the years, it, <clears throat> what I found is far too many personal political ambitions of individuals um, created a situation where the movement, the, the, the leaders of the movements, the leaders of various social movement organizations left into existing parties rather than try to build something from scratch. They explain it to me as a, the reasoning behind this as, well, it's impossible to do this in Ukraine without an oligarch backing you. That might be the case, but they certainly haven't tried. They've been very quick to jump into oligarchs' own parties. So I think here, uh, some gentle, some of the blame should be placed on some of these activist leaders who did rise to prominence and then did not, in fact, look to build their own movement party. And that obviously takes a lot of work and probably wouldn't happen in a year or two's time. Um, when it comes to readiness to protest, the readiness to protest is, uh, in fact, is correlated both to protest participation and to views and perceptions of protest. What is interesting is that there's a portion of people in our samples. Remember that that um, 
the question I told you about pro protest e efficacy, believing that protests do in fact influence the situation in the country, and that, that that has declined over the seven years, but protest readiness has gone up. There is a portion of people who are protest ready, but don't believe it changes the situation in the country. So I think here, uh, some qualitative research is necessary to figure out why that is the case. If you don't think that protests are efficacious, why would you be more ready to protest? Is it because you just need to act and do your civic duty or need to be engaged to feel like you have control over the political situation and that could be a driving force? Or is it that generally speaking, I don't think protests are efficacious, but I think the moment is now where I must protest because perhaps this time they will be. On, <clears throat> on the issue of protests from Boris Gengalo, one of our dy a dynamo in the Ukrainian community in Ottawa, um, have networks of protesters carried on from one decade to the other, or is a new network form in each era? So the roughly a decade between you know the the first one in 91 or was it 90 90 i was actually there yeah 90 and then orange and then maidan so is there a kind of do you seek a continuity yeah absolutely that's actually something that i wrote about in my book um i have a whole chapter dedicated to mapping and tracing the intergenerational connectivity between various moments of activism in ukrainian history including in the orange revolution and i just recently um published a, a chapter in a book uh on what what was different about the Evromaidan and uh, why it was difficult for activists to control the square, as it were. And one of the things uh, that my research, I think, showed quite clearly was that at least a portion of the people who became the faces, the leaders of the Evromaidan um, had the broad majority had protest experience and were leaders of past movements and did have connections to a variety of elite actors. But there were particular, there was a particular group of, um, I, 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 I actually want to take that back. I don't want to call them the leaders, but the faces of Yevromaidan um, <clears throat> that had very little uh, own personal experience and knowledge of even past protest events. Um, I, I embarrassed one person quite publicly, uh, Dominique, you were actually there in Princeton when I did so, um, when this individual suggested that certain things had never happened in Ukrainian history. Um, so I think the Yevromaidan and precisely why uh, the crowd could turn to violent repertoires so easily was because some of the leaders lost control of the crowd itself due to a lack of experience. But generally speaking, activist generations over time have cooperated, have exchanged information, have provided each other with pamphlets, have given moral or physical uh, financial support to each other. I think the this is also the 30th anniversary last year of the revolution on the granite. And I think what was so uh, really remarkable at that time is that, you know, these youngsters at the time, like Doni and others and Kirilenko, who were organizing the student action, were fully and entirely supported by some of the grandees of dissident movements like Chornovil um, or of the trade union movement across the country. But what Chornovil and these other very, very famous figures did not do is they did not um, become the face of the movement. They were willing to take a back step, let the Donis and the Kirilenkos take the, the center stage, but support them in a variety of ways. There's even several very, very uh, nice photographs detailing how Chernobyl would sit uh, on the Maidan with and join the hunger strike with those then as he, he, he himself called them youngsters in an interview. A and he really didn't want people to take photographs of him per se, because he said it wasn't about him. So that was a really remarkable moment. We see a little bit less of that again in the Yevromaidan. There were people certainly willing to get right up in front of the camera and take ownership of the movement, which I think also, um, and these tended to be the less actually experienced individuals, um, which which I think did, did um, cause a lot of problems for the movement um, as it unfolded. Ivan Kachanovsky is asking, how reliable are contemporary interviews about the student protests on the Maidan in 1990, so the revolution on the granite, 
as a student and quasi-participant observer in all significant protest actions in Kiev until summer 90. My experience suggests that the number of participants in political protests was relatively limited compared to the two Maidans that came after. Um, they were certainly much smaller in size. Uh, yes, of course. Um, I think taking into consideration the Soviet context at the time, the type of oppression that was uh, at hand, um, the, the the different, the ease of which communication travels today versus then, a variety of these factors, they were still quite large in size. The largest, I believe, was just, at, the lowest estimates are about at, um, 100,000 in total, um, but several around the 20,000, 30,000 mark of the marches and um, the viches that were organized. So, but some people don't recall from 1990 is that there was a wave of various protest events. The student hunger strike on the Maidan was just one element of them. Um, and yes, they were smaller in size, uh, certainly. Uh, I generally don't think it's a good idea to interview people after the fact, especially several years after the fact. But if we didn't conduct the interviews in 1990, then we sure as heck better do it today because we will miss that even very problematic data if we don't. Um, although a lot of uh, individuals have given interviews over time, those documents can be looked at. And there is a great deal of, of, of variety of archival observational data available. Um, I came across one journalist's uh, notebook from 1990 to 94, a series of notebooks that they shared with me to have a glance at. They were based in Kiev at the time and it was like, this amazing treasure trove of information because they took notes down not even thinking of the possible significance later on in history but sure enough it was uh, I mean open my eyes on some things um, but yeah we should interview them even if they're problematic yeah so speaking of young people from Andrew Kadikalo I found the statistics around young Ukrainians interesting not necessarily pro-EU democracy I think that there's common assumption that young Ukrainians and even Russians are more pro-democratic due to being more active on social media or the internet. What are their alternative attitudes? What are the, uh, the alternative attitudes then? Their alternative attitudes. So one thing that I want to just clarify, the Yevromaidan generation is no longer the youth today, right? They were the youth. Some of them might still fall in the under 25 year old category, um, but uh, many of them are older now, yeah? So they're not necessarily the young in the terms of how we would talk about this in, in social science uh, context, but, um, and the youth, the people who are between 18 and 25, overwhelmingly supported actually Zelensky, right? So we know that he was a very popular candidate um, for, pre for the presidency, not necessarily Sluha Narodo in the same case, but for the presidency um, in their mind. And the young people, the 18 to 25 year olds today are in fact, uh, slightly more pro-European. Pro um, it's the ones that were 18 to 25 in 2014 that are not. So they were socialized at a time that should have resulted in their pro-European attitudes. Um, I think many things explain why their attitudes are as they are. Uh, and I think it's best to understand them as divided, split, uh, mixed amongst that group. Um, they are more likely to have the same attitudes as people from their socioeconomic background, as people with their family financial situation, as people of a certain region, than they are based on their age alone. So I think those are the factors that are more important in driving their attitudes and behaviors on a variety of things. So we can't say that that group has certain attitudes, but rather that people that belong to other groups within that age group have certain attitudes. Um, and that's a much longer conversation uh, to unpack. We have a question from Zsuzsa Czerge, director of a virtual ASN. Thank you for your terrific presentation. The question is, how do you see the differences and connections between different kinds of contention, mass mobilization, dissident circles, opposition NGOs, like the Helsinki group back in the 70s, uh, 
Um, they were on your combined list about the history of contention, and it would be great to hear your thoughts about when and why one or the other emerges and how we should distinguish in our analysis. Oh, absolutely, Jija. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for uh, for the kind words. And um, it, it's certainly important to distinguish these things. And this is something that I repeatedly talk about in my research. We must distinguish between actions, um, actors, and the various networks that they form over space and time, right? So the Actors are the individuals that come together, the organizations that they form, um, uh, the, and the networks that they, then those actors and organizations form are typically called social movements. So we talk about activists as the actors, the organizations they form as social movement organizations, and then the social movements over space and time that connect typically along ideas and not so much along actions and repertoires connected to that, but not necessarily fully overlapping with that is different protest events, different protest actions, different contentious episodes, right? And a very particular type of contentious episode is a mass mobilization. And I am fascinated by mass mobilization in particular because all of a sudden those activists and those social movement organizations are no longer the dominant actor or player um, but rather ordinary citizens are. So they're all interconnected in a variety of ways. Uh, they overlap to some degree, um, but actions are separate from actors, which are separate from the social networks that they form over space and time. All right, let's pivot to, uh, to the edges here from Ari, Ari Evashuk. The right-wing nationalists in the 2014 Maidan were a small percentage of the total number of presenters who told us 5% according to your surveys. However, they had a negative effect on support from the West. Do you think that this loss of support was significant? Would the West have done more to support Ukraine than was the case? And there not been the right-wing and their Nazi symbols and violence. I think there's a few things loaded in this question. So um, I, I'm not so sure they necessarily had a negative effect on the West support of Ukraine. I think it's the first thing that I would, I don't know, Dominique, I see you slightly nodding your head. I hope you don't disagree with me. I don't know. I, I think in some, the West certainly does not support the radical right in Ukraine, um, but that small, uh, group that was indeed uh, there and is present or that, I mean, the radical right-wing organizations that are around today are not necessarily what was happening during the Maidan itself, right? We have a different story um, and an expansion of these groups in the aftermath, and that's a different scenario. Um, so I don't think necessarily that their presence had a negative effect on Western support to, um, do I think that, uh, I mean, I, in normative terms, me personally, I don't see anything good about the, the radical right, and I certainly would not support any radical right displaying Nazi symbols, although to my knowledge, no Nazi symbols themselves were displayed during the Maidan. None of our, we have hundreds of photographs taken of the Maidan itself by our research team, and I, I wouldn't say that Nazi symbols were on display. Um, there were a series of, uh, of viral images uh, that were false and fake that were sent around social media that did have Nazi uh, figures and, and symbols, but that was not actually the case on the Maidan. Radical right-wing organization symbols were in fact present. present and um, I mean, their ideology is not something that I certainly would support or espouse to in any way. But I think here there's a, a few things in this, this question that need to be a little bit further unpacked here. Um, and yeah, uh, one thing I would say is that 
I don't think the radical right is in any way uh, stronger in Ukraine than in other countries in the region or in the rest of Europe. I don't think it's a particularly Ukrainian story. I think it's an interesting phenomenon that definitely needs to be studied. But one thing that irks me the most um, about people who have studied radical right wing activism in Ukraine, it's they do it from 2014 onwards. Um, and the history of radical right wing activism in Ukraine, just like all the rest of the history of activism in Ukraine, is far more interesting than that. And specifically, uh, the, the in my own research, uh, very briefly, I thought I was going to um, write a short piece about the radical right in 2012. And I tried to count the number of organizations uh, that would be considered considered radical right across all of Ukraine and count their membership. And I actually found that the number of organizations was higher in the East and higher among Russophone speaking populations, which I found to be particularly interesting and not fitting in the general dis way we describe the radical right in Ukraine as a Western pro-Ukrainian ethnic phenomenon. Um, I think that story still needs to be researched and told, and I would encourage individuals to, to do that. On the question of the coup, um, the perception that it was either a, a rebellion against state violence or a coup, um, that is that the violence brought an abrupt change in government. Um, so your data shows that in all of Ukraine, it, it is a, if almost a fringe position or certainly a minority position, three to one, 60 to 18, as I recall from your slide. But I think if you break it down, like let's say Southeast Ukraine versus Central West Ukraine, then the 18 gets closer to 35 and perhaps 40%. That's my sense from other surveys that I've seen. In other words, in, in, uh, in the Russian speaking Southeast, in Ukraine proper, obviously that these surveys are not conducted in the territories currently not controlled by, by the Ukrainian state that opinion is divided, um, it's not a fringe position. Um, so my question is, um, in, in your own surveys, because you in your presentation, we got the, the, the sense that the same question included um, coup and CIE plot, but yep. one could have a view that, no, CIA is not involved, that's conspiracy theory, that's nonsense. But it's still a coup because violence was used to bring down a government in that perception. Do you do you separate it or is it conflated in your questions? No, no, no. Uh, of course, it's separated. The question had uh, that question actually asked which of the following statements best describe what happened to Ukraine in the final stages. Um, and the, the options were that it was a Banderite coup d'etat, it was a CIA plot to destabilize the country, it was a Russian plot to destabilize the country, um, politicians cut a deal without the best interests of the people, and then finally the people rose up and successfully deposed um, the regime. Uh, and you're right that there is an incremental, so if we just slice the data to only look at the East, which means only Kharkiv, Donetsk, and Luhansk, and when this question was asked, we actually were able to ask it in almost all of Donetsk and Luhansk, because this was May 2014, so we were one of the last surveys that managed to capture mm -hmm. Uh, individuals in places that we are no longer able to do. Um, and uh, yes, if you slice it only in that group, it would be slightly higher. So the actual number for coup alone is 11%. And the number I believe is just is about 18% in the East or 20%. It's actually not, um, uh, uh, you know, in the 30s, 40s, 50s. So it's a substantial portion of the population. So two things. Um, I do not mean to make light of the fact that some people believe that what happened was a coup. I fundamentally disagree with that position um, based on my understanding of what a coup means according to the political science theory I know, but I do not mean to make light that there is a group of people that believe this. And I think you're very right to point out not so much that in the East, it's actually a larger proportion of people that believe this, but 
in the country doesn't matter where people that is a lot of people actually so if we combined that CIA plot and coup, which we did for our analysis as what we believe to be disinformation campaigns, um, that 18% is a lot, uh, you know, one fifth of a population believing that this was either a coup or a CIA plot is significant. And oftentimes this group is forgotten in discussions of what motivates and mobilizes the voters to vote a certain way or potentially people to leave the country and migrate or protest. Uh, so I think I, I think it's not so important that in certain regions this number is higher and it is, although not so much, but rather that a substantial portion of the country believe that. Um, and in order to win a national election, you need those people to vote for you as well. So the way that presidential elections work in Ukraine, you need people from all across Ukraine to support you. Um, so people with very diverse and sometimes controversial views greatly matter. And I think they should be, this should be addressed in electoral politics in Ukraine. Great, time is flying. We'll, we'll take two more questions. Um, the second being on migration, because I've been saving that one since we've been talking about uh, protest and now uh, uh, Maidan itself. Um, so from Yulia Ivanyuk, thank you for this amazing presentation. Several Western scholars have attributed slowness of political reformation in Ukraine to Ukrainians' lack of ability to cooperate with each other and compromise. What's your take on this? So on the one hand, Ukraine is prone to protest, but there may be a deficit here of social coordination. Well, it doesn't that, I mean, that doesn't make sense so much because how can you both have a collective action problem and be collective action, you know, extreme? So I don't think coordination problems are a particularly Ukrainian thing for that reason, but I do think there are other variables at play when it comes to, um, political economic elite being able to compromise under certain contexts. Now we've had periods in Ukrainian politics where political economic elite are able to compromise, are able to coordinate. Um, I think on foreign policy, this has been particularly successful. Uh, I mean, several people have written about this. Paul Danieri wrote a fantastic book um, also where he details this. I think that this has been possible on a variety of national policy issues. There has certain be, certainly been uh, competition rather than coordination and cooperation. Uh, I have said this more than once. I think a lot of the current political opposition's tactics are um, are not fruitful and are certainly obstructive and they are highly electorally un unpopular uh, and I do wish that there was a little bit more uh, meeting at least some of Zelensky's team halfway on things. I don't in any way want to make Zelensky out to be a fantastic politician or his party to be really substantively great. But I think um, considering the context Ukraine is in, uh, I would like to see Poroshenko, the former statesman, be able to do some cross party line compromise cooperation and at least prop up Zelensky in some of the most difficult moments, especially during the escalation of Russian army along the border. That's exactly the moment where uh, we would have liked to see um, a little bit more uh, coordination, cooperation and and some very visible uh, and and in public statements of support. Uh, and yeah, I, I, I certainly think that when Poroshenko lost, he was an extremely sore loser. Um, and the whole electoral campaign for the parliamentary elections was so disastrous precisely because he decided to go on full confrontation with Zelensky and his team rather than focus on actual policies that the electorate wants to support. I hope they learned their lesson because that that parliamentary loss was even more dramatic than the the presidential loss uh, earlier in the year. Um, so Yuda, 
uh, I, I think that it's an elite compromise and coordination problem, not so much a Ukrainian compromise and coordination problem. All right, last question from our dear friend uh, from the University of Texas, Austin, Cynthia Buckley, who knows quite a bit about migration. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. In terms of migration, what about destination shifts? According to official Russian data, Ukrainian citizens coming into Russia have declined markedly since 2017 with a concurrent rise in the out migration of Ukrainian citizens from Russia and a negative migration rate overall in 2018. While family networks can assist with migration to some specific destination, many others remain fairly challenging to navigate. Your data points out the rising desire to migrate, but where? Cynthia, I will send you an email with the information there in full because I need to triple check it. Um, we do see a shift. Uh, I actually reported on that a year ago, but I am, I'm really, we do a, see a specific shift uh, into countries. We, in our data, we, we did see some people, an increase amongst uh, some respondents of wanting to go to Russia, but we also saw an increase of wanting to go to Germany. Um, uh, Canada was not high up on the list, which I found interesting, um, precisely because of the social network ties component. But other European countries outside of Poland, of course, were high and Germany was one of the, the highest up there. Um, so I can check our data because it is panel data over two years. I can check if that over that period of time there was a shift to any place in particular, but our data isn't um, doesn't capture 2017 or 2018. So it would be from 2019 to 2021. Um, I think there's a portion of individuals that will continue to want to migrate to Russia for a variety of reasons. Um, some are political in nature, some are personal ties, capacity, um, ease, uh, comfort language skills, so on. Um, uh, but I think more and more Ukrainians, uh, including Eastern Ukrainians and Russian speakers from the East, actually see Poland and other EU member states as uh, more attractive destinations. Um, Typically, these are not around political or values uh, norms or aspects, but rather in our research, we did find that it was connected to a better financial situation and therefore likely a better financial future for themselves and their family, um, whereas Russia was seen potentially as more unstable. We also have focus group data on this. So look for our paper at some point coming soon to a conference or journal near you on the migration factor in Ukraine over the last two years. Thank you, Olga. Now I'd like to invite back uh, Kasian Sultikovic from UCPBA for a final word on behalf of UCPBA. Thank you, Dr. Rell, and thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rell for your fantastic presentation. Uh, it was great to listen to the, uh, the discussion and between the both of you. And thanks to everyone for sending in your questions as well. Always great to have lots of questions and a great discussion. So thanks everyone for attending this evening. It was uh, a pleasure for East PBA Ottawa to once again, uh, co-sponsor this year's uh, 35th annual Ivan Kumko Memorial Lecture. I want everyone to uh, stay safe, get vaccinated and I think we're coming up soon, both for our friends in the United States and here in Canada. And for those of you who missed something uh, during this presentation or wanna share this presentation with uh, your colleagues or your friends, tonight's presentation was recorded and will be posted uh, somewhere online soon. And I think we can share that with everyone, maybe on either the Chair's YouTube channel or on the SPPA channel. So thanks again, everyone for attending tonight. Thank you again, Dr. Onluk, and thank you, Dr. Harrell, uh, for your time as well this evening. So thanks everyone and have a good rest of your evening. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you, Olga. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching you.